Hello and welcome. My name's Chris Moses and for the next 20 to 30 minutes I'm going to be talking to you about the process of conducting an appraisal. First of all, a little bit of background as to who I am. Um, I'm Managing Director of a small HR company based in the East Midlands and we currently provide employment and personnel advice to a um, number of town and parish councils as well as county associations across England. So appraisals, well, my first question to you would be, why do you want to do them? They're time consuming, they're not always popular, and they produce, can produce quite a bit of paperwork. So why do them? Um, and this is a question that we ask quite a few councils when we're asked to guide and support them through the process. And we get an interesting array of responses. Um, pay award. We want to find out how much we should be increasing or reviewing the employee's pay for the coming year. And the appraisal will give us a benchmark to make that decision. Indeed, um, some councils who are using the NARC template employment contract will find that in there, there is a contractual commitment to deliver annual appraisals. There is also within the pay section, a statement that says, pay will be reviewed based on performance. And quite a few councils link the two clauses together and use the appraisal to achieve the pay review. Deal with disciplinary issues is another response we often get. The fact that um, if an employee isn't performing to the standard that the council would like or conducting themselves in an appropriate manner. And the appraisal gives them a way in to start talking about these issues and trying to put them right. Uh, I've already mentioned the NALC template contract. It does say you will conduct appraisals. Therefore, some councils feel it's a obligation. We've got to go through with it. My response to these answers is that they're not desperately positive, are they? Um, if you, for example, ask somebody, how do you perform in your job? Oh, and by the way, the answer that you give will affect next year's pay. Well, it doesn't need a genius to work out what the answer is going to be. They're fabulous. They're the best employee that you've got. Um, <laughs> it's going to result in a very one-sided response. Similarly with disciplinary issues. Somebody knows that they're under review for an issue to do with their performance or their conduct. They may well become quite defensive about it. Um, and my own view on these responses is it doesn't produce a very constructive appraisal process and indeed can be quite self-defeating. I'm not being prescriptive here and I'm not saying why, for what reason you should do an appraisal. My own recommendation is that it is focused on the employee. It gives them a once a year or once every six months opportunity to talk about themselves in their job. Now, of course, managers, counsellors, they talk to their employees on a daily basis. But those conversations are very much work focused. They're talking about how to do a job, what jobs need doing, that type of running the council type stuff. The appraisal is an opportunity for take an hour, maybe two hours, once a year, once every six months to step out of that day to day conversation and to take a look at how that employee is feeling within the workplace. Are they enjoying their job? Are they delivering what they can be doing? Are they fulfilling their full potential? What needs do they have? What ambitions do they have? And let's produce something. Let's now sit down and draft something that will steer that employee and the council towards a productive and constructive working relationship for the benefit of all. Sounds great, doesn't it? It's not quite that easy. A question, who's going to do these appraisals? Um, now, a little bit, I've mentioned at the start who I am, what I do, and I work with councils to deal with employment issues, to deal with personnel issues. Because of that, we tend to get drawn into a council 
when things are difficult. And one of the difficulties we we experience is where councillors may be looking to get involved in this process because of some issue they want addressing. Let's be very clear about this. Doing an appraisal involves handling lots of sensitive personal data. And it involves making a decision about the management of that employee. So you're gonna be talking about performance issues. Personal issues may come into the conversation, problems at home, um, aspirations, ambitions, achieve what, what they want to achieve and planning out what their future is going to entail. That's a lot of sensitive data. So it has to be managed in a confidential manner. What I'm saying here is that normally, the people who do an appraisal are those who can justify that they're doing it in pursuit of a legitimate aim. Now that's an important phrase because it, it caps, encapsulates the confidentiality requirements, who can see this data, and the council's ability to comply with the data protection regulations of 2018, generally referred to as GDPR. So if it's the clerk who is doing an appraisal of their subordinates, office staff, deputy clerk, the RFO, the workforce, then it's not unpractical for the clerk to carry out that appraisal on their own. They may be supported with one or two councillors, but the, the clerk is carrying out the appraisal in their role as line manager. Who appraises the clerk? Well, the clerk's management body, the default manager, is the full council. That may be anything from up to six selected members, up to 20 or even more. So just think for a minute about the practicalities of that. Are all of those elected members going to squeeze themselves into a meeting room to carry out this appraisal with one individual? It, it, it sounds quite bizarre, and it certainly um, doesn't sound reasonable or practical. So the council has to delegate the responsibility, and that delegation has to come to a, a committee Lots of councils have personnel committees, employment committees, HR committees, call them what you like. They're the same thing. They're responsible for managing the employee, the, the, the employment practices and procedures of the council. What that means is that other elected members who are not members of this committee cannot justify having access to this sensitive personal data in pursuit of a legitimate aim. They're not managing employment affairs. They've stepped out. That has now been delegated by formal resolution to the committee. So the members of that committee rightfully have access to this information because it enables them to do their job. Those councillors who are not members of the committee cannot say the same thing. So we have a committee, but even so, that committee may consist of five or six people. So we get back to this practical issue of them all squeezing into one room to do the appraisal. So again, there's gonna be further delegation to a more reasonable number of, M uh, of councillors to do the clerk's appraisal. Now there's a legal point to bear in mind here. No individual councillor can exercise management control or management responsibility. This is a piece of case law that goes back to 1986 in the House of Lords, and it's referred to as the Hillingdon Authority. And um, what their lordships decided back in 1986 is that, as I've already said, no one councillor can exercise management responsibility. And if you think about an appraisal, it involves giving feedback on performance, conduct. It involves talking about future achievements, future ambitions. It involves producing an action plan. That amounts to management responsibility. So to comply with the Hillingdon Authority, it has to be a committee, a subcommittee of at least two members who are going to carry out the clerk's appraisal. Another important point to bear in mind here is that the people who are doing this have the right 
authorization to do the work. As I've said a few minutes ago, we get involved in councils when things are going difficult and it's not uncommon for us to hear a complaint from a clerk, from other employees, that the appraisal process was horrendous. They were subject to bullying, intimidation, browbeating, endless criticism by councillors who didn't have the authority to do it. So it's important, first of all, that you don't browbeat, intimidate or bully the employee, but also that the councillors who are doing this appraisal have got proper authorization to protect themselves from allegations of this nature. So I've given a, a, a one or two examples on, on the slide there as to what the terms of reference for the committee, the personnel committee, or delegated subcommittee may want to contain. Ensure the appraisal of staff is undertaken and inform full council that they're being conducted. Not the results of the appraisal, not the content of the appraisal form. That, as I've already said, is for those councillors who have a legitimate aim in the management of the employee, perhaps the personnel committee. But the full council can know, yes, we've done the appraisals, they're out of the way for the year. The committee will appoint a panel of two members to conduct the clerk's appraisal. The outcome and associated action plan will report back to that committee. The committee will also hold a budget to cover the cost of the resultant action plans. And I'll go into that a little bit more detail shortly. So appraisals. So far, this wonderful ambition of giving the employee the chance to talk about themselves, to discuss their problems, their needs, their aspirations and what they've done well. And we now know who's going to carry out that process. Doesn't mean you're not going to come up against a few hurdles. And there are pitfalls with appraisal. Um, employees, in our experience, can be resistant, can be reluctant to go through this process because for one simple reason, nobody likes scrutiny. Nobody likes to feel that they're going to be subject to criticism and their experiences of appraisals in the past may have been exactly that. So you're going to experience some resistance if that's been the employee's experience. Um, I'll tell you what the purpose of the appraisal is. Let the staff know, inform the employees, we're going to be doing these appraisals for this reason. Um, hopefully, they'll see then that the council are committed to, to them and to giving them an opportunity to talk rather than what their own concept of, uh, of the appraisal will be. Not explaining the benefits of the appraisal, making the process overly bureaucratic. I'm going to talk to you shortly about appraisal forms. Um, I encounter some very involved appraisal processes that council use and they can involve lots of paperwork that generally ends up either being stored on the computer or in a filing cabinet somewhere and gathering dust. It needs to be kept to the bare minimum of what is actually necessary and I will talk to you about that shortly. Failing to produce an action plan is one of the key pitfalls of an appraisal, as well as ignoring action plan if one has been produced. There's nothing more demoralizing if you're doing an appraisal to sit down with your employee, the appraisee, get last time's appraisal form out and say, let's just have a look at the action plan. Ah, mm, yeah. OK, uh, right. Well, we've all been very busy. Or we haven't had the money. The lockdowns didn't help the implementation of action plans if that involved delivering training. So a lot of councils are now finding that their plans that they put in place just gathered dust. So let's talk about an appraisal form. Well, what I'm not here to do is lecture you on what is a perfect appraisal form. There are many varieties out there and there are many that are suitable for your council and some that are not suitable for your council. Let me give you an example of one type of format. Here you will see on the slide that there is a question, how much satisfaction have you gained from your employment? Score naught to five. How much have you enjoyed your day-to-day -day job in the past? 12 months, naught to five. How helpful have your colleagues been, naught to five? So that doesn't involve 
writing anything down, coming up with uh, answers that explain anything. It's simply asking the employee to put a tick against one of those numbers. At the other end of the scale, there are appraisal forms that do ask for comments, that do ask for the employee to elaborate on the sheet. Um, and as you can see, there are open questions there with a text box underneath for the employee to put their thoughts, their opinions, and their ideas down. Now, when I talk to councils about the type of form they want to use, some will say to me, well, that form there with the answers and the written responses, I can't see the workforce going for that. And the usual response, if one of those is used with some employees, is that they're given the form a week before to have a read through and maybe to put some answers in. And when they come to the appraisal meeting a week later, they've not done anything because they don't know what to put in there or they don't want to commit themselves to something that might not be what they want to say in the meeting. Similarly, this format, some people will say, well, it doesn't give our employees an opportunity to, to expand and to explain. What I'm saying is that you choose the format that suits you. I'll give you this example on the screen at the moment. Some people will say to me, well, our workforce, the landscapers, the litter pickers, the people who tend to the recreation ground and the cemetery, they don't generally want a form that they can pour their art out on or give long written explanations. That is something that might work quite well for them. But if we come to the clerk and the deputy clerk, they're not just going to want to tick a box. They're going to want to elaborate. They're going to want to explain things. So that format may be more appropriate for those employees. I've already said there's no right or wrong form to use. You find a form that suits the nature of your workforce. You can use two different forms if you want. If you find that this will work for some people. This will work for others. Why not? It's the purpose here is not to have a uniform appraisal form that is the same for all staff. It's to have a form that works and something that's appropriate. So by all means, vary the form that you use. Now, let's talk about implementing these forms because quite often, I'm talking a minute ago about the pitfalls and difficulties of appraisals. Let's talk about how we overcome those. Um, and one of the real problems for employees, if they're handed an appraisal form, they look at it and they think, oh, oh I'm not going to answer that. Mm. Well, I might even have to speak to the union about this one. Let's get the employees involved right from the start. My suggestion is when you are drafting the appraisal form for your council, give the drafts to the workforce. Have a meeting with them. Pull them all together and say, right, I've got some options here for appraisal forms. I know we're going to, we're looking at doing it, but I want your response. I want to hear if you think this will work for you or whether we need to change it. So they have some input and that gives them some ownership. And that may well, when they get this form, make it easier to use. They'll recognize it. They'll see that they've been taken notice of and therefore they're more likely to participate. Similarly, Take your draft to the staffing committee, the personnel committee. Get members to put their two penneth worth in. Get their feedback. Get them to amend, adjust, look at the questions. So that what you are going to produce here is an appraisal form that has been bought into by elected members, by the workforce, and is therefore relevant to your council. But then don't leave it as that is our standard form, we'll be using that forever and a day. My suggestion would be every year when you start the appraisal process again, or every six months, do that again for half an hour. Just look at the forms and see if they're still relevant. So start looking at the delivery of this appraisal. Well, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the preparation of an appraisal environments. I'm not going to talk about what the right room temperature should be or how the chairs should be arranged. There's lots of information out there and I'm not going to repeat it. 
what I would advise is that, first of all, you use an environment that is confidential. There's nothing worse than asking somebody to be candid and open with you. And then you start the meeting and the phone's ringing. There's workers walking in and out to collect timesheets or members of the public at the, the hatch in the window. It doesn't work. Find somewhere confidential. Now, if that means going off site, why not talk to the HR department at the principal authority, district, borough council, county council, and ask them, do you have a spare room that we could borrow for a couple of hours to carry out some appraisals? And that will overcome the problem that a lot of town and parish councils have in that they only have the community centre or the village hall, and that confidentiality is unlikely to happen. Similarly, with the timing of the appraisal, do it during the employee's normal working hours. Now, if it's the clerk that's doing the appraisals, that's fine. Everybody's at work at the same time, hopefully, and they can do their subordinate appraisals during working hours. But if it's the elected members who are appraising the clerk, those elected members may have commitments during normal working hours and may be working themselves or have caring responsibilities, and they may prefer to do it in the evening. My suggestion would be not to do that if that is outside of the employee's normal working hours, because you're going to hit resistance. Um, you're going to hit some reluctance and the nature of the conversation during the appraisal meeting may not be as constructive as you were hoping for. So, let's talk about the preparation process again a little bit more. How do we get this ball rolling? Well, I've shown you some questions earlier. Let me just go back to them. Talk about how has your job altered in the last since your last appraisal? What, what work have you been most successful at? How much have you enjoyed doing your work? A simple question here is, what is their work? What do they do? What can you? What are you measuring these people against? Opinions, ideas, feedback? It's got to be objective. You've got to have an objective set of criteria that said that is your job and that's what we're assessing you against. And the obvious source of that information is the employee's job description. Just a thought on that, because most job descriptions can be rather outdated. They can contain information that is no longer relevant and were produced possibly 10, 20 years ago. It's not uncommon for me to encounter a job description for an employee that was produced in 2005, 2009, and contains a lot of activities that the employee no longer does. Similarly, back in 2005 and 2009, the concept of the clerk having to maintain the council's website and its social media presence and updating the Facebook page and the various other social media outlets that there are would never have been thought of. Now, it may well be an intrinsic part of the clerk or the deputy clerk's job. So what I'm suggesting is that you sit down with the employee as the first meeting and look at the job description. Cross out those jobs that are no longer relevant. Add in the ones that are they're not on there, but should be on there. And that gives us our benchmark, the cornerstone for the whole appraisal process. Because what we're now doing is we're assessing the employee against what the council wants from them in their job. It's not about opinions, it's not subjective criteria, it's work focused, and most importantly, it's non-discriminatory. So that first meeting may well involve just going over the job description. And that's a good approach. Uh, for example, if you've got employees who are really dead set against appraisals, and we do encounter that. And this is an opportunity maybe to, to ease them into the process by getting their feedback on their job description. Not having to go through an, a, a form, which they may be reluctant to do, but instead talking about something that already exists and bringing it up to date. And in doing that, you can actually start an appraisal process, not necessarily have to use the form, but going down the job description, you can refer to the various activities, for example, picking out the ones that have been successful at, just tell me what you did there, how well did that work, 
what do you need from the council to help you to do it better in future? We're starting now to put together an action plan. Similarly, I know you didn't enjoy doing that last year, and I know that was difficult for you. Tell me a little bit about it. Give me your feedback. What can the council do to help you in future overcome those problems? And that starts the appraisal process rolling. Even though the employee wasn't keen to do it, by using the job description as the first part of the process, you've got that ball rolling. However, let's not produce a job description that just cherry picks what the employee wants to do. Take those job descriptions back to the staffing committee, the personnel committee, and get members to agree that they're comfortable, what the activities are, so that it remains focused on the needs of the council. Um, I've given you an example here of what an, uh, a clerk's job description may contain. That may be relevant to you, your council. It may be out of date. And that's what I'm talking about. Use this initial stage to bring that document fully up to date. But as I've already said, the appraisal process is about referring back to the job description and assessing the employee and how well they've done. And then that, that assessment is very much focused on what is contained in the job description. That maintains focus on the needs of the council and it avoids hopefully any discrimination creeping into the process. So we're gonna ask the employee, how do they feel? How do they feel that they've performed against the standards that the council requires for that job description. And we're going to encourage them to express how they feel they've performed throughout the period under review. Um, and I've said the, the appraisal form is the way of starting this conversation. Now, what I would suggest is once you've produced your appraisal form, once you've got the job description up to date, then put a date in the diary to carry out these appraisals and a week before give the employee a copy of the appraisal form that's going to be used. They should already be familiar with it because they've had their input. And from that, they will then write down their responses in the week leading up to the appraisal meeting and bring it with them on the day. And hopefully the way that that's been structured will encourage them to give their opinions on how they've performed and express how they feel. Right, criticism, the elephant in the room. Let's not avoid it because it is an essential part. I talked at the start about giving the employee uh, an opportunity through their appraisal to express themselves and to talk about their ambitions and aspirations. But we have to deal with the poor performing issues as well. We have to deal with what should have been done better. Now, my advice is if criticism is part of this process, you stick to no more than three issues. If you do more, it starts to become intimidating for the employee. It starts to feel like they're being browbeaten. So my advice is to find the three key issues, the most important things that need to be addressed and focus on them. And when I say focus, I don't mean that this is a disciplinary process. I don't mean that this is now challenging the employee as to what they did in these areas. What we're going to do in an appraisal is similar to a counselling session. Simply ask the employee, right, we went through this last year, we know it happened, um, we got the benefit of hindsight now, looking back, why do you think that happened? I just want to hear your opinions, okay? What would have avoided that or what would have helped you under those circumstances? And what can the council do to make sure it doesn't happen in future? And that leads us on to creating the action plan. Now, let me talk about the action plan. It's essential. I mentioned at the start, there's nothing more demoralizing than to do the appraisal. Come to the next one, six, 12 months later, get the form out that you have completed and see that the action plan was just completely ignored. My advice when setting out an action plan is that you talk to the employee about what their aspirations are. You talk to them about what their 
needs are, what support and help they require. And then you discuss how that can be achieved. Does it require a formal training events that takes them off site and costs the council money? There are other options. What it, some people refer to as coaching or sitting by Nelly, get the employee to shadow one of your more experienced operatives or employees for a day or three to see how they do the job and learn that it's not going to cost you anything and it may well improve working relations. A number of councils will say, well, that's great, but we only have the one employee, that's the clerk. So how can we get her to shadow or buddy up with somebody else? Well, a number of the counties that we work with have a, a buddying arrangement between clerks. Small councils with only one employee can make arrangements for clerks to share some time together, maybe spend an afternoon or a couple of days working alongside each other to see how they do their jobs, how they put their practices and procedures into place, how they manage their burials, their um, planning processes, and learning that way. And that creates a good working relationship between councils and also helps us gradually take standards up. So there are a number of options to achieve what you've discussed in the appraisal process. Now let's make this action plan work. And what I'm suggesting now is, right, we're going to put down events. So if it is a training event, if it's silica, it could be AAT, it could be spraying for um, weed spraying, it could be a chainsaw certificate. Let's find out where those courses are being delivered. Let's find out what they cost and the dates. And that is the practical detail that goes on the action plan. You may have to adjourn the meeting or the, uh, the appraisal meeting for a day or so while that research is carried out and then come back and say, right, I've got some dates now. I've got some costs. Let's put this into the action plan. Now, before I come on to confidentiality, I just want to talk about the budget. Because I've said you put the costs down on the action plan. Well, somebody's got to pay for that. And what I'm suggesting is right at the very outset that the personnel committee, as I mentioned right at the start of this presentation, the personnel committee allocates a budget. Now, it may need the support of the finance committee. It may need the support of the full council to allocate a training budget to the committee, which it can then share out amongst the workforce to achieve this action plan. So what we've now got is an action plan that has got a better chance of working. It's got actual events. It's got dates that they're going to happen. It's costed out and the money's there to do it. Confidentiality. I mentioned this at the start when I talked about who does the appraisal. This information must be stored and managed securely. It is sensitive personal data. And as I said, only those members of the council who have a legitimate aim to pursue in seeing that data should be able to see it. So we're talking about the personnel committee. Yes, they've got the management responsibility properly delegated to them. They can have access to it. And other councillors, if they're not involved in management, then they don't have the same opportunity. Thank you very much for watching. I hope that's been helpful and wish you all the very best in carrying out your appraisals.